is the Majority Report. Joining us now is Mark Ames. He's a senior editor at Pando Daily, uh, and he has a new piece out called As Reason's Editor Defends Its Racist History, Here's a Copy of Its Holocaust Denial Special Issue. Mark, how you doing? Uh, doing good. How you doing? Uh, I, I hear you're not doing too well. Uh, <laughs> I am not doing too well, but... <laughs> I am a me- so as I, as I laugh uh, at 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 some of the things you've uncovered here and and cringe I'll be uh, yeah I mean my, the cringing yeah. especially will really be happening but uh, yeah, I'll good. do my best to soldier through this um, all right so uh, but uh, but so let let let's start with I mean you basically uncovered a copy of Reason uh, from the seventies that goes into Holocaust revisionism Holocaust denialism. But I love the story of how we got here. It started with you looking at Reason's coverage of, uh, of uh, pro-apartheid coverage. And then you got a response. So explain how we got here. Yeah, well, I mean, a, a little bit further back context, yeah. I should say, uh, you yeah. know, uh, myself and Yasha Levine, who's uh, my colleague, longtime colleague, going back to the days of the exile, the Russian newspaper, you know, we, we spent those years really battling oligarchs and neoliberals. The, the Russian government shut us down in, in late 2008. We came back here, and one of the first stories we stumbled across was had to do with the Koch brothers and the Tea Party. And to us, it just looked like a very typical oligarch, you know, astroturf uh, thing. And what we wound up realizing, we kind of stepped into a hornet's nest and that these, these guys... Um, are involved in politics and uh, sort of creating uh, or making the, the political, ideological ecosystem friendly to them. They've been involved in this for decades on a level even Russian oligarchs never have been. So, so I didn't just take up this story yeah. then. This is sort of the latest chapter. And, and what happened more recently was Rob Unz, that's another whole other story, uh, he's, he's kind of a Silicon Valley right-wing multimillionaire. He was the editor of the American Conservative. He has... He put up a bunch of archives of reason and some of the other old libertarian stuff online. And what I found going through some of those archives of reason uh, was that they, they, they had article after article in the 70s, and then in the 80s in a sort of different way, defending, promoting, backing um, white supremacist apartheid rule in South Africa. <clears throat> and, um, and so as I dug deeper, and I just couldn't, they actually had a South African um, uh, columnist, a regular columnist, a foreign correspondent, Mark Swopel, I guess was his name, mm-hmm. um, who constantly said that white rule and libertarian free markets go hand in hand. And if you hand, if you have majority rule in the hands of the wrong color, as they put it in Reason Magazine, then you're going to have collectivists and socialists running the, running the roots. So, uh, so I, I wrote about that um, a couple of weeks ago in Pando, uh, just when Reason uh, Magazine and Rand Paul and some other bigots uh, were coming into San Francisco to try to sell libertarianism to, uh, to the techie rank and file. Right. And Reason's response was bizarre. I actually have to admit, I, I really thought, certainly a guy like Matt Welch is the editor-in-chief, I really thought he would just say, yeah, that's disgusting. We're not that anymore. Let's move on. Right. And that would have been it. Instead, he attacked me, uh, called me conspiracy theorist, and, made, and tried to make the excuse that, yeah, sure, we did have uh, people who wrote a lot of uh, pro-apartheid stuff, but we also had people who were critical of apartheid. And he point <laughs> in it, he, 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 point, he pointed to an article which, which, which painted a Bantu stand. I don't know how familiar you are with, yeah. with South Africa, but they had these Bantu stands, yes. so Siske, which was just a brutal, it's basically where they herded hundreds of thousands, forcibly removed blacks, and then forcibly packed them in. It's like Gaza Strip sort of stuff, but yeah. you know, potentially worse. I mean, the, the, the uh, poverty and malnutrition rates there were just through the roof. They, in 1985, reason, you know, blew it, blew Siske. It was like a, a, a tourism pamphlet about what a libertarian paradise Siske was. And Matt Welch today said this is proof that reason was anti-apartheid. And so I thought, like, Jesus. So while looking through this, I had also been searched. I also found evidence. I couldn't find the actual issue, but I found evidence from uh, from other 
other articles and letters to the editor that they had put out a, an entire issue of, of Holocaust revisionism, uh, revisionism. There were some angry letters to the editor several issues later that were in the archives. I spent a long time hunting for this. I went through microfiche files of public libraries. I've searched, 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 and I finally found both microfiche and then the original issue. It's February 1976 issue of Reason Magazine. Uh, that is dedicated, that has actual neo Nazis in it. A guy named Austin App, who's considered, uh, you know, one of the founders of all Holocaust denialism. And he was an actual pro Nazi. He was in Nazi uh, groups, all sorts of Nazi groups. He was a fairly well known name at, in the 70s when Reason decided to publish him. He was right. known as a, uh, like a Willis Cardo figure, you know, right. he'd been openly Nazi for decades. So let's actually, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I want you to get into this specific issue and who the people that they chose uh, to publish and, ho and host in this issue are. And then I, 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 and then, you know, connected to that, and we'll get to this more, I'm glad that you mentioned uh, in, the, in the outset that your, your coverage of the Koch brothers goes back several years and the origins of this, of you're looking at reason and all of these outlets is, 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 you know, goes far beyond uncovering the fact that they were, well, I mean, uh, it's hilarious that Matt Welch, the, the defense being, uh, no, no, we definitely publish people who said apartheid wasn't so great. You know, I mean, that's like, I mean, yeah. I don't even, I don't know, whatever the equivalent of damning with faint praise is, uh, you know, as applies. As, yeah, yeah. I, exactly. It's, it's just stunning. But I think what's interesting yeah. that you also get to in this piece and, and connected with uh, talking about who, some of these people are uh, uh, that that reason published was how this fit in. This isn't even if they look at it now as this is sort of an embarrassing thing that Ames uncovered and it's from a long time ago and you know he's a conspiracy theorist. Blah blah blah. I'm sure nobody you know nobody wants. Matt Welch doesn't want this article published, and they would say you know that's just an embarrassing tweak in our history. But you really show how the Koch brothers and this project um, is 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 actually th this revisionism issue is essential to the really the broader project of what the brothers are up to. So those are those are two parts. Obviously, there's a lot to chew on. But maybe start with who are the people in this issue, and then how does this revisionism wasn't just a cork; it fits into a bigger picture that you're uncovering. Right. Well, I should also just add that this weekend, Reason finally responded to the expose of their of their Holocaust denier issue, and right. they essentially denied it. Even though we put the entire issue online and it's all around, and you know, all kinds of people in academia and, and the media have already said, "My God, this is horrifying." Right. They did, they kind of did a non denial denial again, sort of like with the apartheid ones, and basically, yeah, we published some Holocaust deniers, but you know, we're generally don't believe the Holocaust. We just there were a few Holocaust deniers. What's the big deal? And besides, we're we're pro gay marriage and we're pro pot, so we're cool. You know, it, it was pretty stunning. They should have just said, "We're sorry." You know, this is disgusting. And and it wasn't just one issue. I mean, they published uh, several of these guys several times um, for many years, uh, but they particularly focused on one issue. And you're right. There's a politics to it. It's not just out of the blue on a whim. Some Koch brother, some reason guy decided, you know what, I'm a bad person and I'm just going to deny the Holocaust. There's a, there's a deeper libertarian politics to it. Um, so let me first just name a few of the people yes. that are in the issue. I mean, I, I ran by the, both the names of the contributors and the people and the books that were promoted in this issue of reason, books like um, The Myth of the Six Million by David Hogan, um, and uh, that the sounds subtle. Million, yeah, wow. yeah. The, the myth of this, uh, the six million swindle by David uh, by by Austin App. Um, uh, there's a guy from the British National Party, which you probably heard of. Yes. Um, uh, Richard Harwood, his his book. Uh, it's another one of these, you know, the six million this or that and the other. Uh, all these people who went on to work in Willis Car, or many of them in Willis Cardo's Institute for Historical Review. Willis Cardo is a big neo Nazi. This is the Institute for Historical Review is where David Irving, the big Holocaust denier, and and David Duke, of course, the KKK guy, where they also uh, palled around. Um, in any event, I ran these names by Deborah Lipstadt. She's from the Holocaust Museum and Emory uh, University and, and sort of the expert on the Holocaust and Holocaust deniers. And she 
she wrote back and said, wow, you know, wow, this is a who's who of the early American Holocaust denier movement. I mean, that's it. That's how she described the reason issue. So you have, besides Austin App, who I just described earlier, the, the neo-Nazi, you have James J. Martin, who, what's even, you know, more sort of disturbing is that James Martin, um, he began he began openly uh, writing Holocaust denial stuff in the, in the mid-late 60s. And in fact, the magazine he worked on, Rampart Journal, is listed in the Holocaust Museum's timeline of denial. Um, it's listed as a libertarian magazine, Rampart Journal. And one of the backers of that, one of the main backer, really, was Char- young Charles Koch. Mm. Uh, so this begins in 1966. And there's several Holocaust deniers and several issues uh, denying the Holocaust, saying that the Einsatzgruppen were, you know, I, I don't know, like administrators and decent people, and, you know, like, it's just really crazy stuff, and that Germans are victims of Jewish Germanophobia and so on and so forth. Um, and, um, and so James J. Morton uh, uh, started writing Holocaust denial stuff under, under Charles Koch's tutelage in the mid-late 60s. Uh, Koch kept backing him through various libertarian outfits, the Institute for Humane Studies, the Center for Libertarian Studies, uh, Reason Magazine. He was in several issues of Reason Magazine, and even the Cato Institute published a book with his foreword, a Holocaust denial book in 1980. The Cato um, Institute uh, published a Holocaust yeah. denial book in 1980. Uh, yeah. That's yeah, just an important Harry, stat right there. Yeah, yeah. It's, in the, it's in there, and I have the link. You can buy it on Amazon. It's by Harry Elmer Barnes. He's, he's, he's adored by neo-Nazis and Holocaust deniers. He's, like, he's considered sort of the godfather, the link, as Deborah Lipset wrote, between sort of respectable academia and gutter anti-Semitism and Holocaust deniers. Cato in 1980 put out a book, Harry Elmer Barnes, with the foreword by James J. Martin, when James J. Martin was already in this group with David Irving and David Duke. Right. Um, and I think in that year when Reagan won, is 1981, and you just see the Cokes drop all of this like, uh, like a hot potato. They just drop it completely. Uh, and they move a lot of their operations into D.C. And, and just sort of really distance themselves and hope everybody forgets. They so, see the um, opportunity so that the margins yes. have moved to the mainstream, but not yes. all of the margins. So they need to drop those margins that are really unacceptable and then ruthlessly exploit the environment that's been opened up for them. That's fascinating. Yes. Yeah. And so, you know, you have to understand Charles Koch. Uh, uh, I mean, every, he's, he's, he's very unusual among oligarchs. He's, he's certainly the, the most ideologically... I mean, first of all, he and his brother represent the richest brother team on earth, right? They're worth over $100 billion, according to Bloomberg. But they've also been very deeply politically involved for over 50 years, very focused on radical politics in order to, in order to change the ecosystem, the ideological and political ecosystem, to their advantage. And it's worked. They weren't worth $100 billion even four or five years ago, let alone you know 50 years ago. Um, uh, from their viewpoint, it certainly worked. For them, Holocaust denial, well, you see, in the issue of reason, Holocaust denial is very deeply intertwined with trying to discredit and smear Franklin Roosevelt, World War II, and really the New Deal. Right. You have to understand that libertarianism at its core is anti-communist, anti-socialist, anti-collectivist. That's what it is. It, it, it's It's... It's a, a purified, radical, anti-communist ideology. Um, and, and um, you know, they're willing to, to create, like, a, a consistent larger ideology where, where the state should not be telling, or at least the federal government, uh, let's say, should not be telling you whether gays can marry or not and whether you can smoke pot or not, uh, although they do believe the states can uh, uh, press you for that, but not the federal government. And... And so that there's a consistency to their just nonstop attacks on anything that has to do with um, the state, where the state is involved in uh, in helping people or trying to right wrongs in any way. Um, and that's that's really at the core of what libertarian is, libertarianism is. It's 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 you know uh, extreme in its anti-unionism and its anti-welfare state. 
anti-social um, democracy, very anti-democracy as well. And um, right. so, you know, their problem with, their problem in fighting this, his, I mean, history is part of the ideological battle. And FDR is really their monster, their Hitler in, in the eyes of, of right-wing plutocratic biz, big business. They're Hitler because he, probably more than any president, um, radically shifted, uh, you know, some portion of political and economic power and pie from the plutocrat class to, uh, you know, to the working class and to retirees and so on and so forth. Right. For them, uh, you know, and through this, by empowering the federal government. And they've been waging that war against FDR since the mid-30s. To them, he is the world's worst tyrant that ever lived. And they realize they can't dis disabuse people of, of um, uh, you know, of their fondness for FDR and, and then his New Deal program if they can't, if, so long as World War II, which is his most popular cause of all, um, is somehow discredited and undermined. And you can't undermine that with the Holocaust, with people believing in the Holocaust. I mean, that wasn't why we went to war, but certainly after the war, it meant that unlike after World War I, when we realized, oh, there were actually a lot of lies about the Germans, after World War II, we realized, well, the Germans are actually much worse in this war than even we knew. Right. Um, and so the point is they're trying to undermine the Holocaust, discredit the Holocaust, to discredit the thing that protects FDR from criticism more than anything, which is the just cause in World War II. Then if you can discredit that, then, you know, that's why they go after him in this issue. They, they make it seem like Pearl Harbor was a conspiracy, mm. that he, he staged it, or he tricked the Japanese into bombing Pearl Harbor. They're, they're trying to do everything to discredit FDR and World War II together in order then to just peel open the whole, all the New Deal reforms and take it all back. So this shows up. I mean, this is also uh, Pat Buchanan published a book like this a couple of years ago. Yeah. I mean, so that th this just sort of continues and continues. But I think that that's yeah. that's really the essential point that if that basically following your argument that basically we need to the ultimate goal is to attack and undermine the New Deal and any type of more accountable democracy or even. Mm -hmm slight social democracy in America, but everybody loves FDR and you can't distinguish. You can't say, well, he did fight this important war and, you know, and, and all of that, but, it, but domestically he was this horrible uh, communist. And then it'd be funny because people would say, why? And, and, and then you'd have to say, oh, because of all of the programs that have benefited you and allowed you to live a middle-class lifestyle. <laughs> that's, that's why he's this horrible yeah. monster, but you need to yeah. go and you need, to, you need to go and, and really, and then, you know, cause, cause the other kind of amazing things that you pull from some of these guys are, you know, we're the project to make, FDR look like a horrific tyrant runs hand in hand with, you know, Hitler was a humanitarian or a misunderstood I humanist. I mean, I, I, it yeah. really is mind blowing. I, you know, get into that yeah. a little bit because they're literally trying to set that inversion. Like you, it's like the Matrix. You took the wrong pill, and FDR was actually this jackbooted thug, and Hitler was a kind of, you know, maybe naive, eccentric kind of German leader doing his best. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. It is. Well, but, you know, what they were doing, you know, you got to remember also the context. So this is 1975, 76, when, when the Cokes decided to push Holocaust revisionism through, through what they were building up as their, their real mainstream thought thought leader, you know, uh, magazine, Reason Magazine, they decided 75, 76, so this is a time of, you know, after Watergate, fall yeah. of Saigon, um, the church committee hearings. I mean, the talk at that time, people don't remember this now, was that people were ready to do away with the whole Cold War. They were ready to abolish. I mean, it seemed certainly in 75, 76 that that, there, that the CIA was going to be abolished. It was almost a for sure thing that, that, that even like marijuana uh, laws against marijuana were going to be abolished. It was a very, very, um, uh, you know, unusual time, which presented an opportunity for people who are very ideologically focused like the Cokes. And so when you have all of this instability and this 
this complete loss of faith in, in establishment uh, narratives and establishment institutions. They saw this as an opportunity to, to actually reach out. So some of these articles reach out in a very explicit way to new left revisionism mm. and say, hey, you know, you guys are you're, you're doing revisionism on, uh, you know, which is which is right. And you're catching up to us uh, far right revisionists. You, you're revising the Cold War history, right, because the libertarians and the new right thought fighting communism abroad was was actually just more welfare state. Stuff. What, you, what they want to do is fight communism at home nonstop, like McCarthy did. Right. Um, so they said, so you're revising the point of the Cold War, you're revising, you know, you're doing revisionism on Vietnam War, you've done it on World War I, now it's time for you to do it on World War II with us. <clears throat> and um, uh, so, so, yeah, part of that was, I mean, when you can start... Um, when people lose faith like that, and if you can start to convince them that, you know, why does black, black, white, like the John Birch Society, which Charles and David Koch were members of and their father helped start in the 60s, was constantly putting out propaganda that, that the civil rights movement was controlled by Moscow, that Martin Luther King was an agent of Moscow and that he was a puppet run by Moscow, uh, that Earl Warren was a puppet of Moscow, that, that, Ike was an actual, you know, knowing, willing, witting agent of Moscow that he was. That <laughs> one was true. In Moscow. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. exactly. <laughs> that one, we'll yeah. grant you on that one. Yeah, yeah no, I mean, so, Ike, obviously, he was a pretty, I yeah. mean, if you just, some of his some of his stuff on collectivizing the means of production and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, yeah. use versus exchange value. I, you know, I just want to be intellectually honest here. Well, and, and his head is as shiny as Khrushchev. Right, you exactly. Know? And that's all yeah. you need. And that, that's in order to put those ideas in. Yeah, exactly. So, um, so, uh, so, yeah, some, you know, these guys were writing. Uh, they, they did this also in the Rampart Journal when Charles Koch was a funder and a trustee of Rampart College. They were writing this stuff that, uh, you know, the, the Nazis were misunderstood, that they didn't want war, that, you know, actually in the issue of reason, uh, Austin App, the neo-Nazi guy, writes in reason that the Munich Agreement, which which gave Nazi Germany, which gave Hitler uh, chunks of Czechoslovakia, um, he writes in reason that the Munich Agreement, and it's even a big poll quote, so reason was clearly proud of this. He writes that it was not appeasement; it was um, uh, it was it was belated justice, is what he called it, and wow. and called the okay. Czechs, yeah, and he said the Czechs were chauvinists, and Hitler only wanted to avoid war. And it was a man of peace, and uh, you know, and 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 he was forced into all of these things uh, against his will. And then, of course, that must mean that the Holocaust is a lie, and it's a lie because, as Austin App wrote, uh, they used fabricated corpses to blackmail Germany. Um, it, it's, and all this stuff is in reason. It's just crazy, and it's again, it's crazier still that. Nick Gillespie, you know, the, the, the Fonzie of libertarianism, I'm sure you've seen him, the, the, the leather jacket. Oh, guy. yeah, he's very cool. Very, yeah. very cool. <laughs> very cool. Hey, there's no Holocaust. Hey. Yeah. Hey. You know, oh. Yeah. So, like, uh, he, he, um, he wrote over the weekend that what you read is not what you read. I mean, sure, there's some Holocaust denial there, but that doesn't mean there's Holocaust denial there. It's right. the craziest response. I don't, I, I don't get these guys, like back off and, and, and admit it. And I think, you know, one of the problems is that some of the main people who were in charge of that issue are still in charge of Reason, the Reason Foundation, the, uh, which publishes Reason. They're still in charge of it today. So Robert Poole, and, uh, who was the editor-in-chief of, of Reason in the Holocaust denial issue. He's still both a board member and an officer in the Reason Foundation. Okay. Ma Manny Klausner, who was the co-editor, is still today um, a board member of Reason. David Koch, Koch for funding it. He, Koch is still a board member of Reason Foundation. Uh, Marty Zupan, who was the books editor, and she's on the masthead. She's today the president of the Institute for Humane Studies, which is their big recruiting outfit and Charles Koch's, you know, longest outfit. So these people are still around. So I guess they're worried that, you know, if they admit the obvious, then they have to maybe do some accountability for it because, but they have these people still in the organization still running it. Right. No, no, I think that that, that, so that's, that's the key, just the, uh, you know, the material point of it, right. That, 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 that these people who, 
uh, were responsible for this in the past uh, could still be implicated. It's not like, well, you know, in the 70s, we had a bunch of, you know, that was a crazy time yeah. and all of these people are kind of yeah. gone and discredited. I think that's one that's obviously one big part of it. But the other thing, you know, and as we head towards wrapping this up, I can just think of and, and this is taking it, you know, so we'll we'll leave reason and go to the calls that we get on this show. And the joke will be like every time I, I am, I sometimes I'll I am Sam when he's taking one of these calls and I'll say like, all right, it's time to get him to endorse slavery. You know, like how, how many minutes will it take before, you know, it's like, all right, well, I did yep. call in to say that taking away my light bulbs is destroying my freedom. But if you insist, yes, Alabama should be able to have slavery. I mean, you know, yep. so so that there is, I guess, the, and the point is, is that it seems like even on, you know, even on the basement to uh, calling podcast and YouTube show level, all the way up through, you know, being a, someone who gets invited on Bill Maher and writes for reason, mm -hmm. the, the, just that, and as you say, that the first thing they always will say is, oh, no, come on, guys, we're cool, we're pro-pot, mm -hmm. we don't hate gay people. But mm -hmm. there is this almost more, um, I, I'm, I'm hesitating to make this because I'm not 100% sure if, if I would, you know, if I could defend this, but I would say even more so than other areas of the right, not all there or there is more comfort with totalitarianism and mass political oppression in libertarianism as any other ideology as exists is how I will put it. And that it's just kind of stunning that a thing that just continues to sell and sell and sell and shout from the rooftops that it, it's l literal and sole purpose of being in politics is freedom constantly <laughs> finds itself in whether it's you know apartheid or holocaust revisionism or pinochet, yeah. pinochet or Pino yeah. well yeah pinochet yeah. is the is the classic hero. example yeah, yeah i mean that's because that's yeah. literally i mean he did hand the, the policy apparatus to them you yeah. know what and what does that just say i guess you know i i, I have a sense obviously of what you'll say but i just kind of want you to go to bat on just how again like what more will it take to just fully re really discredit this thing and how this example, again, of their response to this and the double speak and the and, and and also, I guess, and I and I do apologize this is where my sickness is coming through a little bit. But I think it's like the the that it's not just double speak that the bottom line is is that this that they could write that South Africa was one of the freest places in the world because they're not thinking about Africans and Bantu stands. They're thinking about a liberalized exchange rate. They're thinking about less labor laws. And that's always the bottom line. Yeah, no, I mean, the reason why, you know, there, I have uh, also downloaded from reason, or the Libertarian Review, I guess it was. Yeah. Uh, I think it was a speech to the Libertarian Party a convention in 1980 when David Koch was the vice president, where where in one section on foreign policy, this guy, you know, said, look, one area where we really need to back off on and need to be conscious of is South African apartheid is way too popular among libertarians, and we need to tone this down. <laughs> um, right. and, 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 yeah, and he said, you know, and, I, and the guy even admits I was caught up in it, too. And he said because of gold and because of, you know, libertarians right. believe in, in minority elite, property elite. Elite means property elite, right? Yes. We, we, we've, ha we've allowed the right to redefine elite as like some, some hapless academic in their ivory tower or some pundit somewhere. Elite right. is money and property, you know, and that's what makes this so hard to battle. I mean, if, this, if libertarianism didn't have the funding and the backing it had from the, from, you know, the world's wealthiest extraction industry people, I would go nowhere. But if you bombard people, the propaganda works. It right. does work. It works, and it's very hard to disabuse your brain of, of, of these things. And I found a lot of resistance, especially going back a few years. I think less so now, but I, definitely at first when I was critical of these guys, uh, a lot of resistance on the left to say, you know, oh, they're not, you know, so that is, and this is actually the radical right wing of neoliberalism. This is right. the radical right, uh, um, uh, and, it's, and its goal is not to fully take power necessarily, but to always push things right and to, and to remake the ecosystem. And let me just add one more thing, yeah. um, getting back to your point about why Holocaust revisions. And there's, a, there's another point that uh, I, I, I may write about this. 
that we might forget today because uh, neocons have, I think, probably changed some of the image of the public of Jewish intellectuals, let's say, because so many neocons were Jewish or are Jewish. Um, in the in the 70s, Jew meant socialist or, right. or leftist um, intellectual. It just was almost one and the same. Certainly from people on the right, it's a huge reason why they hated Jews. It's why, a huge reason why Hitler hated Jews, you know? Uh, right. Uh, the Jewish Bolshevik, the Jewish Marxist, it was basically one and the same. And I still get attacked sometimes as a uh, a cultural Marxist. It's just a code word for Jew, you know. Yeah. Um, and even Milton Friedman had a, a lecture that was turned into an essay. And one part of it, it's subtitled uh, The Anti-Capitalist Mentality of Jews. And he gets into why are Jews so anti-capitalist and he thinks they just misunderstand uh, history. And, um, you know, it's not so much the case now, but, but I think people understood then in the 70s when they were reading Holocaust denial stuff and reason, they understood that we're actually attacking, you know, an anti-capitalist uh, ethnic group, I guess we're called Jews, religion, ethnic group, whatever, but, yeah, you yeah, know, no, no. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. That makes total sense, and you still, yeah. and I think, and I think it's actually, as you say, I mean, just those same tropes around the Jew, Jewish intellectuals have just been... Yeah. That is where this ridiculous idea that America is run by an elite of, as you of you know, of academics right. and pundits. It's just the same stereotypes right. just deployed, right. you know, beyond uh, beyond Jewish intellectuals. So the piece right. is uh, in Pando Daily. Everybody needs to read this. It really is astonishing. On uh, you know, re a reason editor defends its race and racist history. Here's a, here's a copy of its Holocaust denial special issue. Uh, but uh, but as you've been hearing with Mark, it's also just the bigger context as to why this isn't a historical oddity. This is still playing out every day in our politics, and that's why, uh, unfortunately, you do have to see uh, Nick Gillespie's uh, uh, leather jacket on on TV. I wonder where he got those things, or how many he has. He must have like a revolving, like uh, you know, one of those spinning <laughs> hangers. He just, <laughs> just grabs a different leather jacket. <laughs> It's so ridiculous. I wonder now. if he just takes photos of himself in the like mirror as well. Hey, 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 free market. Hey, <laughs> so it's like he's like a. I don't even know. I I was gonna say like he's like a not cool person's version of what a cool person would be, but I would say a not cool person in nineteen eighties version of what a cool person would be. It's very problematic. But hey, Mark Ames, I really appreciate your time as always. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me on. Uh, it's great talking to you. 